All right, where am I now? I don't know. I do know, but I don't. I don't know the name of this lake. But what I do know is, if I was to carry along this not-so-well-traveled chunk of logging road, I would end up, the next lake over is a lake called Elsie Lake. And I've had a handful of people write in about having experienced these bush people at Elsie Lake. Um, I don't know the name of this lake, but I do know this Strathcona Park, where the late great John, Dr. John Bendernagel had his first experience of these forest people was in that park right there. Right there. This, this is the, uh, the border of it. So he would have been that way somewhere, a little more that way when he uh, cast his first track and they also heard one, I believe, amongst other experiences he had there. Had a lot of people emailed me lately about uh, experiences along the Ash River, Ash, Maine, which is that way, <laughs> right along here. Uh, Kennedy Lake, Kennedy Lake's that way. Lots of sightings there. I'm basically right in the middle of it. Nobody's here at all. Do I feel any pressure? Nah. I got a little bit of a, my attention's being pulled to the timber on this side, probably because it's just big, dark timber. Obviously, in that hill up there. Am I nervous? Nah. My senses seem to be kicking in a little more, though, than the last spot I was at. Whatever. Good place to share from. I got my exploring done. A little more exploring anyway. I like going where I've never been before. Let's get into it. Let's hear some voices. This is titled, My Dad's Encounter. Good morning, Steve. I am Joshua Lemire. I hope I pronounced that right, L-O-M-I-E-R. And my dad is Rick. He asked me to shoot off an email of an experience he and I had out here in the Sierra Nevada, where what became the Creek Fire Burn Scar area near Clover Meadow. He gave me permission to share another, share another story from of his as well. Rick has seen a Sasquatch on a few occasions. Those encounters were mostly times he was on a picnic with my mom and had seen them watching at the edge of a meadow. And most recently, when I got my bear in August 2019 during bow season, he says he saw one following us as I drove the side-by-side -side down the hill back to the truck. The encounter he asked me to share happened during bow season 2017, which is late August, early September, for us out here in California. We were hiking down an old logging road toward a meadow a couple miles above Clover Meadow. As we approached the meadow and the logging road, we had a row of trees in between us and the meadow so dense you couldn't see more than a couple of feet in. We also had the wind in our face, so we knew our scent wasn't picked up when all of a sudden a big buck runs across the road from our left to the right. It ran so fast, all we got was a blur of antler and body. A few seconds later, we heard three knocks. It sounded like two wooden baseball bats being banged together, but a whole lot louder. We both stood there frozen in awe what just happened. My curiosity got the better of me, and still looking for my first deer kill, I woke. I walked to where the deer crossed the road and tracked it into the woods for about 100 yards. My dad began heading back to the truck. About the last 20 yards or so, I got a feeling of being watched in danger if I continued tracking. So I decided to go through the woods towards where the road wound back around and would meet my father and would meet my path out. Once I started walking back, the feeling of danger left. But I felt like I was being followed on my way out. Every couple of minutes as the wind wound as the wind wound shift, sorry. Every couple of minutes as the wind, I believe you meant wood shift, I'd get a horrible smell on the air that told me I was really being followed. I got back on the trail right behind my dad, and we walked out to the truck together, both feeling like we were being watched. Once we got back to the truck, we dropped the tailgate and each had a beer. I think that may have been closer than either of us wanted. Another encounter we had was back in about 87. He was working on a on some cabins up near the Shaver Lake area and would do some bow hunting after work. One day as he got out of the truck and down the trail when an unexpected rainstorm came in making it so dark he could hardly see. This is where it gets strange. Not being able to see he wasn't much he wasn't sure which way to go once he came to a Y in the trail to get back to the road since this was a loop 
that would take Once he came to a Y on the trail to get back to the road, since this was a loop that he would take, that would take you around, and the truck would be at the end of the trail. He chose the side and started walking down, when all of a sudden a rock landed a few feet in front of him. Not knowing what it was, he kept walking. A couple seconds later, it happened again, so he thought that maybe something was telling him to go the other way. He turned around, took the other fork, and continued on to the next fork in the trail. The same thing happened again. He walked one way and a rock landed a few feet in front of him, so he, knew, so he went back and took the other fork in the road. This happened a few more times. When he went the right way, nothing happened. But if he took the wrong fork, then a rock would land in front of him, turning him to the other fork in the road. A couple hours after the first fork came out at the road, sorry, a couple of hours after the first fork, he came out at the road, but no truck began walking down the main road back to their camp when his buddy came up, relieved to find him ending that one. My dad, and look, my dad and I look forward to hearing you read this one and thank you for having a place for us to share. Joshua Lamier. Lamier? Hope I pronounced it right, man. Uh, I read that kind of awkwardly. I'll admit it, my senses are going off a little bit. I just, my, my attention, what happens for me is if I think I hear something or feel something, my attention goes to that direction. And it's tough when I'm reading because my attention isn't all on reading, right? So there. I've never been here before. I've only been here for since I've been doing this. Not a breeze, not a loon, not a duck, not a nothing. Dead quiet. There might be a loon down at the other end of the lake, though. This is a quiet place, man. Sun's, sun's getting ready to hide behind the mountain. Let's get into another one. Mark, this is red. <clears throat> Near Bankhead Forest, Alabama, it followed me all day, is the title of this one. I'm in his mark at 53, I've hunted and trapped and fished my whole life and still do. I live in southern, middle Tennessee, and have worked in forestry for many years. Excuse me, my work is mostly in southern Tennessee, Mississippi, and Alabama. Although I do cruise timber and audit tree plantings for the most part, I'm the guy they send to paint boundary lines in the deepest, darkest, hard to get to tracks of timber. It's because they love to find shed antlers and deadheads and the big ones are in the hard places. I love this shit. So you're the guy that gets there before me. <laughs> some of these places I like doing, especially the deep timber, and then I'll come around and here's a marking from somebody like you. I'm like, damn, that was the only one that ever walked here. This happened February 2019 in Alabama, about five miles west of Bankhead Forest. First, a little about my job. Most days I start off walking before dawn so I can be at my line by daylight. Paint two and a half miles or so of boundary lines, and then turn and burn, trying to beat darkness back to my truck. This is my last day on a 12 mile track. So I had to walk out, walk about a mile in to get back to where I'd stopped painting a couple days before. That meant I was parking in a different spot that I'd been parking and was on the far side of the track, right next to Bankhead Forest. From the time I left the truck just before dawn and started down an old overgrown logging road into a deep hollow, I had the strangest feeling I wasn't alone. Now I'm not easily scared. After years of stomping all over the swamps full of cottonmouth snakes, wild hogs, and briar thickets, a rabbit would have a hard time getting through, I had no fear of the woods. But I was getting an uneasy feeling because I kept hearing six, because I kept hearing footsteps over on a ridge to my right. I see and hear deer mo almost every day. This didn't sound like a deer, but I thought it had to be a deer or a hog because it was so early for turkeys to be pitching down. I moved on and didn't think much about it. 
that something didn't feel right. I made it to my line, got out my scraper, cut a hole in the top of my paint can, and away I went, scraping and refreshing the paint every 30 feet or so. Ever so often I'd hear a limb snap, or more footsteps, and I'd stop, look for what made the sounds, nothing there each time. It seemed always, it seemed to always, but in the thicker areas too, it got to be funny because I wouldn't hear anything. And then when I'd take a break and be sitting there resting, it would start up. I could plainly hear footsteps coming in my direction. This went on for most of the day, to the point that I could predict when it was going to start. I'd sit, get a drink of water, eat a bit of food, and sticks would start to snap, then the soft footfalls coming my way. Never seeing anything coming, it was starting to make me weirded out. So I came up with a plan to get a look at who or what was following me. I was nearing the final corner of the track where I would finish this map. The corner of the tree was at the top of a long slope about 200 yards up and made a left turn. My plan was to get just over the ridge where I couldn't be seen and watch the long slope I had just painted. Right on cue, I heard footsteps coming. At this point, everything changed. The woods got completely silent, not a sound, just soft steps somewhere down there in the thick. It became dark like a thunderstorm. It was coming over... Sorry, I thought I heard something over there. Not a sound, just soft steps somewhere down in the thick. It became dark like a thunderstorm was coming over, but no wind. My ears were ringing but it was like I couldn't hear, as if I were underwater. But then I see and hear leaves on the ground moving about halfway up the hill. It was like someone walking and kicking up the leaves as they walked. I froze. There was a sound of something walking up the hill, but nothing there to be seen. My heart racing, I stood up, and in that second, it was right next to me, just 10 feet away. geese. I plainly saw and heard the leaves move, but whatever stepped out from behind a huge tree wasn't visible. I could feel the hate. I wasn't welcome here. Everything in me was screaming, get out of here. That was it. I grabbed my gear and I made a dash down the hill. I didn't stop for a long time and made record time back to the truck. A way back, a way back when I stopped Away, there's a few spell outs, typos, sorry guys. All way back when I stopped to rest, I'd hear snap, then the soft steps again. I felt like I was being herded out of there. I didn't notice when everything went back to normal, but when I got back to the truck, all was fine. No dark clouds, and birds were singing again. All the sounds of woods were back. I thought it was a ghost until I watched your videos. No, I'm not so sure. Everyone I told got a good laugh at how Mark was run up by a haint, hind, H-A-I-N, H-A-I-N-T, maybe you meant by a giant. So I stopped talking about it. I'll never forget it. Thank for your videos. They've helped me understand a little more about this. P.S. I've also been whistled at from really close behind me. It was so close that I spun around expecting to see a mad hunter standing there, but nothing. No one there. I said out loud, you've got great camo, I can't see you at all, sorry, and just kept going down the line. I was shook, I couldn't understand why I couldn't see him. Now, I may know why. I've also heard the jibber jabber yelling down in the deep hollow. They sounded pissed at each other, but I couldn't understand one word. I didn't even know that that was a thing until your videos. Thank you so much, Mark. Wow. I'm hearing something. Anyway, Mark, thanks for that, man. I don't know what the deal is with that. Leaves kicking up, people seeing footprints, people seeing tree branches moving, and nothing's there, but they can hear it. I don't know. Maybe, uh, possibly, I wonder if the owl man knows about that. Hey, man, owl man, I'm sure you're here. I wonder if you know about that, anything about that about the 
somewhat invisible or absolute invisible beings that do exist. This is going on. There's no way it isn't. Way too many people have reported seeing that shit. Way too many. And uh, we'd be pretty thick between the ears to ignore thousands of people reporting the same thing. That's all there is to it. So I can't explain it. I hope that didn't annihilate your time for your job or your being in the woods, man. But uh, I can relate, you know, I go to the same places you guys go and more by myself. And uh, like I said earlier, I'll get more stressed about it the night before at home than I do when I'm actually doing it. Once I slip into that timber, for some strange reason, I just get a, a calm. I feel calm, I feel focused, I feel good. And I go about doing what I'm out there to do. And then, uh, but I, it's funny that when I do get way back in that timber, I'll sit on a log or sit against a tree or sit on a perch on a shelf and, and then you start picturing it, you know, you, you can start to picture it. You start picturing something being really angry, you're pissed off that you're there and they're going to make sure you leave and it's going to take a long time for you to leave. <laughs> that would really, really suck to be uh, tormented the whole way, right? That would suck. Anyway. Get some more out. Sometimes I gotta scroll through because I don't. I, I a lot of times all the emails in here aren't experiences and there's something else. That's this sounds. This title sounds familiar. I wonder if we read. How marked is read. Title: These hairy bastards cost me everything. I think it might have. We'll see. First of all, I want to thank you for giving us a place to tell our stories and freeing us from our emotional prisons that seeing these things causes. I emailed you some time ago about my first encounter where my 12-year-old son was being screamed at while he was sitting in his hunting blind. Well, since this happened, I recently have had multiple encounters that have cost me the things I love most in my life. I live in Florida, but my wife and I purchased a second house on nine acres in rural Georgia along with a 180-acre hunting property that we leased from a timber company. The hunting lease is located 10 miles away from our house. Hunting has been our passion for many years. Now it's all gone. These are the encounters that led up to us walking away. I wonder if I read this. Number one, in October 2015, I was traveling to our Georgia house by myself for the opening of gun season. I just crossed over the Georgia state line on a two lane road in rural Georgia. It was just starting to get dark when there was still enough light that my headlights hadn't come on yet. The road had a very long straightaway that I could see about one mile away. I've been watching a man on a riding lawnmower repeatedly turn around at the edge of the road and then disappear for 30 seconds and he was back again. When I got about 300 yards from the mowing man, I could see a huge hairy man standing beside a pine tree watching the man mow. He was pulling down on a pine branch that was about 10 feet high so he could see the man. As I approached, it looked back at me and then just disappeared. I knew that I had to imagine it because I could see the pine branch bouncing up and down where he let it go. The thing that scared me the most is once I got to the tree where he was standing, I had no memory of the rest of my trip. Alright, I haven't read this. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in the driveway of my Georgia house, which is 45 miles away from my sighting. I had no memory of driving through several towns full of red lights and intersections. I couldn't account for over one hour of travel. I immediately called my wife to tell her what happened and what I saw. I could tell she believed that I saw something, but she was having a hard time with the whole Sasquatch thing. This would change later. Holy shit. Number two. The next encounter happened November 2017. Again. I was at our Georgia house by myself. Our house was 23 miles from the nearest town in a very rural area. I just finished unpacking my truck about 11.30 p.m. when I found a new laser pointer that my son left in my truck. He wanted me to try it out so I could tell him just how powerful it was. So I walked to the end of the driveway to a two-lane road that ran in front of the house. The only light around me came from the porch light behind me. I started shining the laser down the pitch black two-lane road lighting up road signs that were over one mile away. In the distance I heard a scream and this orange ball of light seemed to float into the middle of the road about a quarter mile away. I wasn't sure what I was looking at so I pointed the laser at it. 
The next thing I knew, the orange ball of light started coming at me fast. I could hear what sounded to me like bare feet slapping the asphalt. I turned and ran as fast as I could into the house and locked the door. For the next 20 minutes, I could hear something walking around the house. I stayed up all night with my rifle in my hand until daylight. I didn't bother hunting that weekend because I was pretty shook up. I told my wife we got the same, I told my wife, but I got the same reaction as before. Again, this would change. Number three, November 2019, I'm sitting on my 10 ladder stand, waiting on first light. I like to get to my stand an hour before first light so that the woods would calm down from my track to the stand. I just got situated in the stand, put my headlamp in my backpack, when I started hearing a low growl coming from behind my stand. I wasn't concerned because I'm 10 feet off the ground. I could hear something slowly walking up to my stand, thinking it was a coyote or a dog from one of the nearby houses, whatever it was. What? Whatever it was had stopped at the base of my stand. I can hear what sounded like breathing. This went on for three or four minutes when I felt a hand grab my ankle. I could literally feel fingers on my leg. It scared me so bad that I jumped up onto the seat of my stand to get as high as possible, kicking my backpack that contained my headlamp off the stand. Now I'm trying to listen to where this damn thing is, but all I can hear is my heart beating 100 miles an hour. I stood up there for the next 45 minutes until it got light enough to see my surroundings. Now I had to get up the courage to get out of my stand and make a run for my truck, which was on the other side of the property. Once I got down, I looked all over my backpack, but it was nowhere to be found, so I took off to the truck. When I got to the top of the trail, I could see my truck again through the trees, so I started running. I got about 10 yards from the truck and stopped in my tracks. There on the ground next to my truck was my backpack. I'm 48 years old at the time, and I had tears running down my face. 35 years of hunting, and I had never experienced anything like this. I quickly checked my surroundings and made a dash for the truck. Once I got the truck started, I was having a difficult time pressing on the gas pedal because my legs were shaking so bad. When I finally got moving, I went straight to the house and told my wife what happened and to pack her stuff because we're leaving for Florida. I could tell she was starting to believe me by the look on her face. We skipped the rest of the hunting season that year. Holy shit. That is your worst nightmare as a stand hunter, period. Number four, March 2020, I finally got the nerve to go back to the Georgia house because I needed to do some much needed maintenance on the house and property. When I'm up there alone, I always fall asleep in the chair watching TV. At 3.30 a.m., something hit the front door pretty hard. I jumped up, grabbed my 30 6 out of the gun cabinet, and went out on the front porch. I shined my flashlight all over the yard when I heard a whistle come from the tree line to the right of the house. As I started walking towards the tree line, I heard another louder whistle come from behind me in the dark. I decided my best option was to get my ass back in the house because I was outnumbered by something. I'm pretty sure that a human wouldn't whistle at me while I'm standing there with a loaded rifle. This became a nightly occurrence every time we went to the Georgia house. Number five, October 2020. I really had no desire to hunt anymore, but my wife didn't want me to give up something I've loved for most of my life. She decided to hunt with me that day to get me back in the woods. Opening morning. I walked her to her 10-foot ladder stand that overlooked the bottom. Nervous about her being out there, I just sat on our golf cart 50 yards away behind her in the pines so I could get to her quickly. Around 7.30 a.m., she texted me that she could hear something growling out in front of her but couldn't see anything. I offered to come and get her. She said she's okay. 15 minutes later, I got a text from her saying, come and get her now. I made it to her stand in about three minutes. Once she got on the ground, she had the total look of fear on her face and said, let's go now. She didn't say a word until we were at the truck and out of the woods. As she started telling me what happened, her eyes began to tear up. She said whatever was growling started coming towards her, but she couldn't see anything. She could see a good 50 yards in any direction, but couldn't see what was growling. The next thing she knew, something was about three feet in front of her, growling and breathing heavy but nothing was there. 
She said that once she heard me coming, the growling and heavy breathing stopped. She never heard it walk away, but everything stopped. She... Once we got to the house, we decided to just go home to Florida. A week later, we decided that we had enough. We let the hunting lease go with all of our tree stands still on it, and we sold the Georgia house with everything in it. The only thing we took with us was the firearms. I lost everything to do with something I love for most of my life, all because of these damn things. Now, I know you like to hear that someone quit hunting, but I was afraid that someone was going to get hurt or killed. I've been carrying this dark secret inside me for a while now. Thanks to you and your channel, I finally feel free. Thank you, Steve, for giving me a little peace. You can use my name, Tim Smith. Damn, Tim! That sucks. That really sucks, but I see there's a part two, and I'm going to read it now. I've included it. I don't even know how long this has been in the, the notes here. But the hand on the ankle thing in the tree stand, in the dark. Can't make that shit up to get any worse. This was in uh, August 22nd, 2021, you sent this to me. Let's carry on, shall we, Tim? This is titled, These Hairy Bastards Cost Me Everything, Part 2. Hello, Steve. Can't thank you enough for sharing my story with the world. Oh, I already did read it. Really? All right. Thanks to you and, and everyone around the round table. Give me so much support and encouragement. I feel I need to get back in the woods and take back the thing I love for most of my life. I owe all of you so much for having my back. However, I don't think my wife will be joining me. Holy shit, Tim. That's great. I wonder why I didn't remember this, because I do recall somebody somebody said that something snuck up behind him in the dark and the tree stand and spit in the back of their neck. I remember that one. We had numerous people talk about Sasquatch coming up behind them in their strands. Huh. Must be getting old, mate. My memory's finally starting to fail. As I mentioned in my last email, I'd written you before about my first experience when I let my 12-year-old son hunt by himself for the very first time. I don't think the story was ever shared, so I figured I'd share it again. All right. November 2007. We're hunting in Morris, Georgia. My son was 12 years old, and he had been begging me to allow him to hunt by himself. My son was famous for falling asleep while we were hunting, and I was worried that he would fall out of the tree stand. I was proud that he was wanting to show me that he was ready to take that step so to make us both happy, I built him a ground box stand on skids. We could drag it with the four-wheeler around anywhere we wanted to go. I found the perfect spot in the road that ran between the two bottoms. Saturday morning, we hit the woods for his first solo hunt. He got on the four-wheeler and took off. I was nervous, wrecked, listening to the noise of the four-wheeler in the dark, trying to picture in my mind where he was on the trail every second. Finally, I heard the engine shut off. This is before texting, and he was too far to use radio, so I told him at any time if he got lost or just scared to just shoot one time, and I would come running. He had been in the stand for 20 minutes, and it was just starting to get light enough that you could begin to see the tops of the trees. The woods were so quiet that you could almost hear your heart beat. That's when my life changed forever. I heard the loudest, most terrifying scream slash howl that you could ever possibly imagine. At the end of the scream, it would taper off into a guttural growl. It echoed so bad that I couldn't pinpoint it on the exact location. I was terrified. In the 30 years of hunting, I had never heard anything like it. A few seconds later, it screamed again, and I swear it was louder the second time. It screamed a total of seven terrifying times. If I was, a, if I was scared, I can't even imagine how terrified my son was. I'd made a stand with hinged wooden shutters that he would keep closed and locked until first light, and then he would open them. It was just something to make him feel safe. At 9.30 a.m., I, I heard the four-wheeler start up and begin heading my direction. When I got back to the truck, I was trying to play it off like everything was normal because I was afraid that the kid would never set foot in the woods again. And I could top of the look on his face, he had been through hell. Oh, no. 
I don't like reading this shit. He said that he got to the blind, got all of his gear in order, he's excited, being out there alone, was impatiently waiting for shooting light. About 15 minutes after getting in the blind, he could hear something walking in the bottom to his left, footsteps getting louder and louder until they stopped about 10 yards away from the blind and everything went silent. It was quiet for 30 seconds and that's when he could hear something sniffing the air. He started to hear a growl. It started up low and then got louder. The next thing he knew the growl got louder and louder and then turned into a deafening scream. It was so loud he could feel the vibration on his face. He got so scared that he laid on the floor of the blind and pointed his rifle towards the window. When the screams finally stopped, he was trying to listen for, 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 for he was trying to listen for footsteps, so he would know if it was walking up to the blind. But all he could hear was his heart beating out of his chest. He laid on the floor until he could see that it was daylight, but didn't want to get up. After about 15 minutes of laying on the floor with his eyes closed, he finally fell asleep. He woke up about 9 a.m. and started gathering all of his nerve to finally peer out of the windows to see if anything was around. Whatever it was, had left, had left. He grabbed his gun and made a run for the four-wheeler. He's 26 years old now and has never missed a hunting season since this happened. If anyone asks him, he is a true believer that Sasquatch, Bigfoot, or whatever you want to call, are very real. Thank you again, Steve, for giving us a chance to tell our stories without the fear of being ridiculed. You've definitely changed my life for the better, Tim Smith. Thank God. Whew, that was stressful. That was a stressful read for me. Put me right there. I'm so glad your kid kept hunting. Right? Anything behind me yet? That'd be something else to all of a sudden hear a great big kaploosh. A basketball sized rocket in this frickin' glass like water, wouldn't it? And I would probably be leaving soon afterwards. But anyway, Terry, or Tim, sorry, Tim. It's quite the handful. I wonder if your, uh, your wife still go out in the woods? Would be surprised if she didn't. And this is quite the scene right here. Quite the reflection off the water. The, the lighting is just getting perfect for photography. I'll show you guys what I'm looking at here in a minute after I get some more voices heard. Then we'll make our way out of here. Get home. Make our way home. Wow. You are so lucky that your son kept on hunting. Unbelievable. Alright, here we go. Mark, this is red. This is titled, it's long, but it's all of it. Hi, Steve, my name is Ron. I've lived in the city of Boston, Massachusetts my entire life. I'm guessing not too many counter stories from here, lol. First, I want to touch on the sixth sense. How I agree we all have to listen to it every time. I was 16 and my best friend at the time was 18. We lived to hunt and fish. One day he picks me up from school and we head out to go bird hunting. Steve, the second I got into his Jeep, CJ6, I believe I told him we shouldn't hunt today. He looked at me as if I had seven heads because all we did was hunt and fish. He asked me, what the F are you talking about? I told him I just don't feel right. He asked if I was sick. I told him no. It's just something isn't right. He called me a pussy and started to drive. It's about a 45 minute drive to get there. Not much bird hunting in the city, lol. The whole ride, I wouldn't let it go. I kept telling him, turn around, let's just go tomorrow. We finally get to the cornfields. We're going to hunt. And as he puts the Jeep in park, I tell him to look at this place. Or, yeah, look at this place. You don't feel that? I said we should go. Again, I'm called a pussy and we push on. After an hour or so of my nonstop badgering that we should leave, he finally said, fine. If it'll shut you up, let's just drive this corner and we will leave. 
I said, forget the corner, let's go. I turned my back to head to the truck and boom, his gun goes off. I turned and asked if he got, if he got it, thinking he flushed a bird. When I looked at his face, I knew something was wrong. I asked him what happened and he told me he slipped. Then he thinks he twisted his ankle. So I set him down on a log and when I rolled his coveralls up, I said, Jesus. He asked me what and I told him that he didn't break an ankle, he just blew his foot off. I can imagine that you probably have a good idea how the rest of that afternoon slash evening went. I knew it. I knew it to my core. We should have never went that day. Now for my stories. <laughs> wow. That poor bastard, eh? The first time I encountered Sasquatch, I was hunting in Maine. It was around dusk. I was still a good hour of shooting light left. I was making my way down an old jeep trail, hunting my way back to camp. Off my right, there was a clearing, probably 100 or so yards long, and about 25 yards wide. In the middle was an old apple tree, or just a wild apple tree. I see under the tree what I thought was a black bear. As I went to raise my gun, it stood up and looked right at me. I know bears stand on their hind legs, either to check the wind or see better, so I still think it's a bear, until it took off. This bear never dropped all fours. It stayed on two legs, and it went 50-plus yards in no time. If you tried to shoot, you would have never got a beat on it, with a rifle at least. The crazy part was, when it hit the brush line, not only did it drop to its fours, it put its paws in front of its face, pushing the brush from its face like a person would, not a flipping bear. Yet Sasquatch never entered my mind. I just didn't understand that a bear could actually do that. Two days later, same mountain in Maine, I fell asleep against a huge oak tree. I woke up to the sound of a deer walking. I opened my eyes and there was a monster eight pointer walking straight at me, head down, just marching on a head on collision with me. He was so close that I knew if I moved, he was gone, so I just sat still. He walked up to probably 10 feet and just stopped looking right at me and moving his head left to right to try to figure what the F is in front of that tree. It felt like hours, but after a few minutes, he seemed to blow it off and turn broadside and started heading up the hill. I slowly started to lift my rifle off my lap. He just did a 180 and started bounding. I jumped up, let off about four shots, but after two hours of looking for any sign, I hit this deer, I came up empty. So I decided to head in that direction that he was headed. I made my way to the top of the hill, which was all six to seven foot spruce trees. I see three of the trees in the front row swaying as if I jumped something. So I stopped, I'm looking and listening for movement. All of a sudden I see what looked like an eye, a big black eye. Then I can see a strip of black going down from the eye. I'm staring so hard at this, my eyes are watering. Then it moved. Now I can make out a shoulder and a neck. And I said, holy shit, that's a bear. I went to take one step and the voice in my head said, you are crazy, don't go in there. So I just turned and left the way I came. Steve, I was 19. At that age, I could take on two bears. I was scared of anything and I'm still not. I'm a tough guy, but if I'm alone in a bar and four idiots get liquid balls, I'm in. Anyway, fast forward a few years and my buddy that shot his foot off is able to walk now and we go to scout a place for hunting season. As soon as we start walking down the logging road from where we park, I look at him and tell him I don't like this place. He asked what I meant. I said, I don't know, I just don't like this place, it's creepy. Well, we end up hunting it anyway. One night when leaving we get pulled over. The cop sees we have hunting clothes on Ask we had weapons in the truck. We tell him, yes, two shotguns. He asks where we were hunting. We tell him, and he says, they just found a body back there. We both at the same time say, what? He just looked at us and said, have a good night and be careful. Just went back to his cruiser. Fast forward two and a half weeks. It's now black powder season. We start down the trail, and after a few minutes, I stop to load my muzzleloader TC White Mountain Carbine. This takes maybe 30 seconds. And I look up to see my buddy down on one knee. He was a couple steps ahead, so I walked up and asked him, what the F are you doing? He said, tell me you don't see that. I said, see what? He said, 
You didn't just see that dude jump out of the woods? I said, what? No, I didn't see that. He tells me a guy in all black jumped out of the woods, looked at the two of us, hauled ass up and across the trail and jumped back into the woods. I said it was probably some creep looking into houses. That he should have shot the prick. He said, I don't know, that was weird. Now looking back, I think he knows what he saw because after that he would always ask people what's the craziest thing you ever saw in the woods. Steve, whenever he asked that question, the person would most likely have a Sasquatch story. He asked an old-timer once about the guy, and the guy tells him that he was in Florida hunting deer with dogs. The man said he sat up on a foot trail or a jeep trail and waited for the dogs to push the deer across his trail. He said once he got to his position, he radioed his friend to release the dogs. After two minutes later, the man said he'd seen a tall guy, a woman, and maybe a 12-year-old boy walking down the trail. He said they were completely naked and he could see the breast on the woman clearly and they were all covered in hair. He made a point to say not thick hair, just hair. He said they were walking as if they were just out for a hike. He said that the big male lifted his head back, swinging his head side to side, then turned to the other two, made a grunt, and the three vanished into the woods. So my friend asked, do you think it was Bigfoot? Now this is back in 2002. The topic wasn't on anyone's wasn't on anyone's mind like it is today. The man looked at my buddy and said, "Son, if Bigfoot are people, then I guess that's what I saw." Now, what I saw in Maine, I would call thick hair. So, does the yearly temperature have something to do with how hairy they get? I don't know. So now I stopped hunting for a while, not because of Sasquatch, but because that buddy of mine was killed in a motorcycle accident. That ah, sucks, man. Sorry to hear that. My cousin who taught me everything about being outdoors died of the big C and so and so didn't my old so didn't my old man or so did my old man. It says didn't. So I lost my passion because to me the hunt was all about the story. Every detail of the story. Then I found your channel and it brought back so many memories. It reminded me of how much I truly love to hunt. This year is one of the best years I've had hunting. I didn't fling one arrow. I could have filled a freezer, but I, I'm after one buck. If I, if I get him, I get him. That doesn't matter. What matters is even though I wasn't scared out of the woods, you still did for me what you're trying to do for others, and that is, that was to get that passion back. It means more than you know. Now I can't say, like everyone else, if you're ever in the same location, we will go out to the back 40 hunt turkeys. I can say that if you're ever in Boston, drinks on me, and you probably won't remember the night. Thanks again, Ron, from Boston. Ron, shit, man. If, if I could have been there to go hunting with you, I would have. I'll tell you what. Actually, I feel that way about every single person that writes in and gets screwed out of their hunting passions or loses their partner or their dad or whatever. I'm so glad to hear the news that you came back and that this channel helped your ass out. That makes me going to these damn places and doing this worth it right there, right? Nothing yet. Sure is quiet here, isn't it? Sure is quiet here. It's got to be fishing here. Okay. Something tiny rose behind me, or maybe it's just a, a gas bubble coming up from the decaying vegetation at the bottom. Who knows? It is quiet here. All right, I better be re better read one more. I'm gonna be late. <laughs> There's no duffy no service here, and I didn't tell anybody where I was going. I know lots of people are gonna bitch at me for not doing that, but I'm a big boy now. Believe me, I've been to some crazy places alone. That's funny. To show you guys a quick hunting story. You reminded me of when you said the big eight pointer was coming. You woke up. It reminds me one time I was uh, I was guiding. And then I rode my hunters out to the highway as years ago. Rode my hunters out to the highway, drove them into Fort Nelson, the airport, went back to the remote main camp. Excuse me, and had a few days off, so I went. I went to go uh, stone sheep hunting by myself. And I went up into the mountains. 
across this valley and I hiked up to the top of this the side of this mountain and I made it and I hiked all the way to the very top I think the second day whatever and this was in August so it was really warm out and I laid down on the top of this this mountaintop we're talking way the hell up there no trees way way above tree line and I laid on the top of this mountain and then uh, the temperature was like it had to been the ex it had to have been body temperature the temperature of the air had to have been the exact same temperature as my body because it just felt, and there's no sound, there's nothing, it's dead quiet. Dead quiet, obviously I'm beat, just climbed this damn mountain. And I laid down on this little uh, grassy little lichen patch and uh, fell asleep. And then I woke up. You kind of wake up wondering, where the hell am I? Holy shit. And the view was freaking insane. And then uh, I got up and I'm looking around grab binoculars I'm looking off in the distance looking on the other mountains and I step forward two steps and about probably I don't know 50 feet below me was around 25 stone sheep ewes and and kid and their you know mothers and young and they're all spread out laying down right below me about yeah with 20 20 yards <laughs> scared the shit out of me but it's really cool I wish I'd had a video camera ready to go then who knows if they even walked by me when I was asleep and had to look at me and went and laid down. Who knows? I don't know. But you took me back to that memory when you mentioned waking up and there's a big eight points down there. I'll never forget that time. You know, it's real funny to add on to that. When I was hiking out from that particular day, I had, a, I had an old semi-automatic 30-odd six. And uh, I was slung over my shoulder. And I'm hiking out the riverbed with big river rock. Hiking out. I had to hike out of a I don't know, five or six miles. And uh, the sling popped off of the gun. The gun went boom into the rocks. And literally, if you look down on the gun from the top, the scope was bent like a banana. <laughs> like, you gotta be kidding me. Really? I literally got back to, we're in the middle of freaking nowhere. I got back to the camp and I put the gun on its side on a log round, firewood round. And I got a piece of firewood, put it on top of the scope and I bashed it with the ax, and I bent the scope back enough that I sighted and got it on paper and dialed it again at work <laughs> for the rest of the year. <laughs> oh, the memories will tell you what. All right, get back to people. All right, title this is, I have stories and some shocking observations. All right, we're down. Thank you for reading this. I like hearing the stories. After my experiences, I have an unusual urge to know more. People that have had true experiences know this feeling. Let me just tell you a few quick stories that might help others understand how a thousand pound ape might be living out there undiscovered. First story takes place in Montana, close to Kalispell. I spent most of my summers there right by the right by McGregor Lake. One summer I was about 14, my parents let me take my childhood best friend up there. We'd stay out late hunting coyotes. We never got one, but we would hear them calling. We would go down by the brook that was located behind the cabin. You have to go down the driveway and cut through a small strip of trees that open up to a big clearing with a bog and a deep brook that slowly flows through. That brook separates my grandparents' property from a big patch of unused woods. Well, we were hunting one night down in the clearing. We could hear the coyotes calling so loud and close. We could hear them panting in between howls. But every time I hit the lights, they're not there. Not even an eye shine where I expected them to be. So, somehow or another, we got brave and crossed... Nope, sorry. Sorry, I lost it. So somehow or other, we got brave and crossed the brook and got closer. Every time we did, the calls would fade and get further. So we entered the woods to get even closer. It was making them respond to a rabbit and distress call. But when we entered the woods, they shut up. In the silence between me blowing my call and waiting for a response, a faint two-tone whistle could be heard only about 50 yards away. 
I started shining my light that way. Me and my buddy are saying stuff like, what is that, a bird maybe? Maybe tree rubbing on another? We take a step that went way, we take a step that way when behind us, another identical whistle. We turned that way when we first whistled. When the first whistle happened again, now only 25 or 30 yards away. We knew there was no person or animal making sounds like that. I remember my friend start to cower down to the ground and say something like, Oh my God. I was scared too. I was scared too, but I took control of the situation and grabbed him by the shoulder and let him backwards while I said something like, Just shine the light. While I shot my 22 about 10 times in the darkness, we crashed out of there and ran home. I didn't think it was I thought it was a ghost. Later on in life, I decided it could have been a Bigfoot. It took a long time to say all that, but that's what that's not what I need you to know and share. Years later, in Northern California, where I live, I was helping my uncle find his hounds. They were missing for nine days in a canyon around Kaleida. Kaleida? Kaleida? It's called Humbug Creek. I got dropped off at the top and worked my way down tracking these dogs with old school radio tracking equipment. It was hard and it requires you to triangulate the signal to locate where the dogs actually are. So we're all over the canyon over those nine days. On the third or fourth day, I was on the face of an extremely steep hillside. Me and the guy with me found a spot where a big bear had laid down on this particular tree high on this ledge, under this perfect tree high on this ledge. So we took a break there just to warm our hands when I found a huge pile of shit. I was thinking it was a big bear, probably the one whose bed we're laying in, but these droppings literally look like a pile of horse poop up on a sheer cliff face. I was so baffled I had to know what this was from. Black bear's poo is black and full of berries most of the time. This poo I found at first looked like grass. But no, man, it was pine needles. So I looked up, what is pine needles? I found that only moose and caribou can because they have three-chambered stomach. So I looked up mountain gorillas. They also have a three-chambered stomach. And when I seen a pick of their poo, I was shocked. It was very similar. And I know there's not a lot of other things it could be. I have good reason to consider that Bigfoot could be real. And that was my most compelling experience. It's not smart shooting a gun in the dark or taking a shot at one of these creatures, but if I do get a positive, clear view of one and I got my rifle in my hand, I don't know, man. This whole Bigfoot mystery might come to an end. Thanks for reading, buddy. My name is Sid Smith from NorCal. You can use my name. Okay, Sid. Appreciate it. I found a big pile of crap like that two summers ago. Freaking huge. It was like... And it was, it was within a few days of when our First Nations community in Mount Curry had one of these things went ripping across the paved road broad daylight with fish in each hand. One hand for sure. I don't know if it was each hand or both one hand. And ripped off up the mountain. And there's a lake above there. And I was the first one at this lake and I was walking down the path and there was this pile of shit. It was probably about like this and like that wasn't a horse. Of course, me, it's like, eh, there's somebody playing a funny, right? Because it was the human trail that went down the lake. If I was a Sasquatch, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing. But anyway, Sid, I wouldn't suggest shooting at one of those beings, man. If you see one, it probably wouldn't be a very smart thing to do. And, uh, Another way to look at it, man, it's like this. It's like, imagine if something came here and saw you. Saw you out there hunting. And never seen something like you ever before and thought, holy shit, look at that thing right there. It looks like a Sid. I'm going to dump it and end its life right now so I can show Sid to my friends. You know what I mean? So you don't do unto others what you don't want done to you, right? <laughs> Funny little thought there anyway. Anyway, what time's it now? Should I be getting my ass out of here? 5.20. Okay, let's do one more, right? Then I'm going to swing the camera and show you guys a scene. It's something else to tell you what. Not an ounce of wind and a perfect reflection of those snowy hills over there.
What do we got? Uh, red, 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 red. All right, a couple photographs in this one. Mark, this is red. This is called the New Tenants. Hello, Steve. My name is Norman Clowen. Clone? I hate mispronouncing shit. <laughs> Not shit. I mean, uh, yeah, names of towns and cities and people's names. I really hate it. So please don't find it disrespectful. I'm more of a bushman than I am a uh, an English professor. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. I'm getting tired. All right. Hello, Steve. My name is Norman Clowen. I'm 56 years old and I live in Thompson Falls, Montana. You can share my name like you. I don't give a shit what others think. The U.S. government and its justice system is so broke it's beyond repair and the sheeple don't have the balls to stand up while the government takes more and more away. True enough. But that's another subject. So on with my story. Ever since I can remember, I've known things aren't what they always seem. I can remember lying in bed looking at out the window and seeing things looking at me. When I told my parents, they told me I had an overactive imagination. It wasn't until years later when I first seen the Patterson Gimlin film that I could identify what was looking at me. I've always been in touch with my sixth sense and it saved me many times over, over and to ignore it would cost me so. I learned to listen to it over the years. I've seen things I can't explain like orbs flying in the forest, transparent shimmering beings, like predators gliding from tree to tree. But never seen a Sasquatch except when I was a small child. I've lived in Thompson Falls for 15 years, and the place I live backs up to 2,800 acre densely forested ranch that runs right up the mountains. I've heard lots of tales of Sasquatch down around Graves Creek, which is about seven miles away. One of my good friends that lived down there told me he shot one point blank in the chest when two of them tried to get into his cabin when his kids were young. And you can still hear them hunting the backside of his property and I've heard a voice inside my head telling me to go, feeling in danger. One time I had a three-point buck come over to me, sweating and shaking. It was so close, but it never even looked at me. It just kept looking over his shoulder into the trees as I listened to heavy bipedal steps in the snow beyond the trees and I felt the intense need to leave. Well, to make a long story short, we've had a series of fires down in Graves Creek, and the big guys must have moved this way. We've had a lot of activity lately. Activity lately. You can hear them moving in tandem on the ranch behind us. This last November, I heard a macaw and an owl moving in tandem down the back fence line. When I figured it was about 90 feet away, I turned on my flashlight, and I saw a huge set of red eyes duck behind a tree, and then all the noise stopped. Two days later, I was out getting a load of firewood from the carport when something slapped the plastic right behind my back and then let out a big deep cough. I decided to go in. I decided to go in. Now every night when I go outside to smoke, I can hear them talking. But I can't understand or howling slash moaning. I was cutting trees up by the ranch fence and I could hear bipedal footsteps behind me and catching glimpses of big shadows moving in the trees. I had a real uneasy feeling. I got called to dinner, so I walked inside just as it started to snow. 35 minutes later, I returned and was shocked at what I saw. Two sets of footprints, one coming in and one going out. The steps were about five or six feet apart. I followed the steps back to the ranch fence where you can see it just stepped over the top of the four foot fence. I remembered your shows. My brass balls turns my brass balls turned to lead. Whatever this thing, whatever this was, walked to the corner of my shop and then turned around and went back as if looking for me. I took a few pictures as I nervously went back to work while constantly checking my surroundings. While going back to my pickup, more wood. Something caught my eye. There's a couple of typos in here, I think. I looked up and there he was, right on the other side of the fence. Nine feet tall, at least the top wire of the fence was below his groin. Slender build, 
covered in long brown hair and arms just above the knees. It never even looked to me, and in three steps it was gone, but not far. I could hear it breathe just outside of my sight, and it seems they're always near and watching. And there's the photos. So I'm guessing those were nighttime photos. Kind of tough to see, but I don't imagine you were uh, taking too much, taking too much effort, right? Especially when all that shit was going down. Interesting. Not fun. Sounds like you're sharing the same neighborhood as family. These beings, possibly, right? All right. I'm going to show you guys this lake. Thanks for sending that in, man. And uh, just keep listening to everybody on this channel. Or I'll listen to as many people as you can that seem to know what they're talking about when it comes to this topic, all right? And then govern yourself accordingly, right? Just let them know who you are. Let them know you don't want nothing to do with them and ask them not to scare the shit out of you. I'm not feeling any pressure at all here now. Nothing. Probably fall asleep right here on the ground. I'm gonna hurry up and show you guys this lake, and I, I want to drive a little further out the road before I go home. <laughs> we'll take a little snoop and peek. So let's have a look here. How is that? That's what I've been looking at the whole time I've been reading, when I glance up. Coming up is going to be what I say was Elsie Lake, I think. Elsie Lake or Gracie Lake? Elsie Lake. 